My name's Karis Spray and my debut novel is A Song for Izzy Bradley. A Song for Izzy Bradley is a novel about the Bradley family during a particularly sad autumn. Um, their youngest daughter, Izzy, dies suddenly and unexpectedly and the novel explores what happens next. It's the story of Ian, the dad, who is a Mormon bishop and he's also a full-time maths teacher and he thinks that if everybody just carries on um, like the Mormon pioneers that everything will be fine. And it's the story of his wife, Claire, who is waiting for a sign from God and she just wants everything to stop while she comes to terms with what's happened. It's the story of their teenage daughter Zippy who is in love for the first time and the story of Alma who is um, sceptical and cynical and, and perhaps doesn't fit with the rest of the family and it's the story of their seven year old son Jacob who thinks that if he just has enough faith and just tries um, that maybe he can fix everything with a miracle. When I was thinking about writing a novel, it seemed like an awfully big thing um, to do. And I'd written short stories in the past and I almost felt like I could sort of trick myself into writing a novel if I started from a, from a short story place. So I, I had this picture of Jacob um, in the back garden digging up a bird and I sort of put that into a short story, that sort of self-contained short story. And I told myself that if it worked as a short story, then I would, I would carry on. And, and when I'd finished that story, I thought, yeah, it's okay. And so I wrote the bit that came before and, um, and then I wrote the bit that came after as well. Um, I have, I've drawn on my own experience to an extent, yeah. I, I grew up in a Mormon family. And, uh, and I grew up listening to these stories, miraculous stories. Um, some of them were, were quite prosaic and were to do with things like lost car keys or people being inspired um, on the way to work to take a different route. Um, and, you know, not knowing whether what had happened on the route they would normally take, but, you know, it had all been, been for the good. Um, and then occasionally there were some stories that were really were quite, um, you know, sounded quite miraculous. There was one where somebody had apparently been resurrected and um, they said afterwards that when they were resurrected they could feel the life coming back into them like a blanket unrolling. And I, I sort of had quite ambivalent feelings about these stories. I, at, when I was growing up I didn't disbelieve them but I just felt that I was not the sort of person to whom miracles happened. Um, felt a bit like um, T.S. Eliot's Proof Rock, who knew the mermaids could sing but didn't think that they would sing to him. And then as I got older, I sort of really sort of disbelieved the, uh, the stories, but I was always still interested in them. Um, and I still am interested in, in miraculous stories um, and why people tell them. And so I started with Jacob's voice and I found that Jacob's voice came quite easily. I've got four children, so i um, used to being surrounded by children's voices. Um, and then I sort of had to work on the others. Um, I, I knew I wanted them to be quite a big family. And when I first started to write the novel, there were more children than there are now. Um, and I think there were, there were too many different voices. So. To, to reduce the numbers of children um, and then sort of work on each voice to try and make it different to the others and I wanted the novel to sort of work a bit like a kaleidoscope so it could sort of go click 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 and you could move around the family and you, every time it moved you'd sort of get to see everything in a different way you, you know see all the patterns and and things that were happening um, differently Um, I identify with all the characters to an extent. I think people might expect that, that I would identify most with Claire um, as, as a mother, but um, I, probably, I probably don't. I, I almost sort of 
by the end of the book felt a little bit impatient with her and felt like she needed to to uh, to do something which she finally does in the end but I, I really like Alma and I like his awkwardness and his um, his sort of cynicism but his goodness as well um, I think that makes him quite an interesting character and um, the novel set in Southport um, which is where I live and when I before I'd started writing it, I, I never imagined writing a novel set in a small northern town. Um, in my head, I thought that I had to write a novel you know, that was set somewhere really exciting and um, somewhere really well known. But when I started thinking about the novel, I realised that where I live is, is, was the perfect setting for it. Um, not only because I know it so well, but because also the Southport as a town is sort of this long, thin town and it runs up against the sea wall. Um, and there's a line in the novel that says that the town has its back up against this wall. And, and I think there are times in the novel where Claire, the mother, um, also has her back up against a wall and, and is, is sort of in this dangerous situation um, that's mirrored in the landscape of, of the beach. Um, so yeah, it seemed like a good place to set the novel. Um, I really like the moment, I really like the scene when um, Zippy is wearing the wedding dress. And I like it because it explores this tension, I think, um, in Mormonism where young people are told um, that they mustn't have sex before they get married and they mustn't think about sex before they get married um, but that the most important thing they can do is to get married and have lots of children so they're being told not to think about this but at the same time the adults around them are all talking about it all the time and so there's this tension then and during that wedding dress scene um, people in the church hall are, are having a pretend wedding um, with no bridegrooms, it's just all the girls dressed up pretending. But in one of the classrooms at the back, um, Zippy's there and not pretending with Adam. And I just sort of quite like the idea that the adults are all pretending and uh, Zippy and Adam aren't pretending. Um, and even when Zippy is rescued um, by Sister Valentine, Sister Valentine says, you know, now we're going to go and look at honeymoons. And so again, they're back to um, you know, thinking about sex but not thinking about sex at all because it's not allowed. So I, qu I quite like that scene. Um, Jacob, the seven-year-old, his scenes were quite easy to write, I found, um, because he was the first character and I knew right from the beginning what was going to happen to him during the story. Um, and because the language is quite simple as well, I think his his chapters pretty much stayed the same. They didn't need very much editing. Um, but Ian, the dad, um, I found he, all of his uh, scenes were quite difficult. He was quite um, a polarizing character. When I, when I shared those chapters with my writing group, um, there was um, people who felt that he was like, you know, sort of the tragic hero of the book and, and who really empathized with him. And there were other people who would give me the chapters back um, with, you know, sort of uh, exclamation marks in the uh, margins and, and really frustrated with him. And I, I felt like I was on a tightrope with Ian the whole time between him sort of being um, a sort of noble, tragic figure and an incredibly irritating figure. And I wanted to try and sort of stay in the middle of that. So it was quite, he was quite hard to write. I think readers will, will take away a feeling that um, even in a family where people are very, very different and um, where, where they have their disagreements, that, that they can support each other and that they can help each other through really difficult times. When I was writing it, when I was approaching the end, um, there's a series of, of coincidences at the end of the book which I think the family, when they look back on them, um, will will perceive to be miraculous. 
and, and I wasn't planning on having anything like that at the end of the book at all. Um, but as I was just reaching the end, I, I sort of couldn't resist the, the sort of drive to do that. And, and I think that maybe in writing the end like that, it was perhaps a sort of tacit acknowledgement that actually, um, despite my own cynicism, I think sometimes miraculous things um, can happen.